considering that the first game is among my all-time favourites, you'd assume that I'd be really interested at the idea of a sequel. Actually, I thought the story was fine on its own, but hey, we've got one now. So let's take a look at Nino Kuni 2 Revenant Kingdom and see if it's a worthy follow-up to the original. Even though I didn't really want a sequel, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't excited when this game was first revealed at the end of 2015 with a promising looking trailer. But as we got more and more information, the more and more it really started rubbing me the wrong way. Not helping was Level 5's reputation of messing up their great franchises by rebooting them with a new lead. Something just looked off to me, the vibe looked less ghiblyish, and the gameplay seemed to have less depth. But the promotional material is one thing, how about the final product? Does it tarnish the greatness of the original, or was I wrong to be concerned, and is it somehow even better? One of the first game's biggest strengths was its story, so as a tradition, let's begin there. We return to Ding Dong Dell as the president of some random place in our world called Roland is attacked and then mysteriously sent there whilst becoming younger. He encounters the soon-to-be King Evan, and yes, that is actually a boy, just as a coup unfolds and the evil Mousinger takes over the castle. The pair manage to escape with the aid of Evan's personal bodyguard, Aranella, who sacrifices herself in the process. Her dying words leave Evan with the determination to build his own kingdom, so he and Roland set off on a grand adventure to do so. But as they meet new allies and overcome new challenges, they soon set their sights on bringing peace to the whole world. Oliver's journey in the first game, despite its weak conclusion, was a wonderful epic that not only had the imaginative fantasy of a Ghibli film, but also featured unforgettable characters who I loved journeying with. It also featured a compelling lead who subtly grew over the game at the centre of it all. Evan's adventure isn't bad per se, but the way it's told makes it nowhere near as good as the original. And before I address anything else, I should add that I also mean that literally. Most of the actual cutscenes are quite short, with most of the story being told via conversations. It feels like the game is almost scared of taking away too much interactivity from the player, leading to awkward sequences like this. Evan! Uh, that was... Gripping. And finishing one conversation only to walk three feet to start another one feels a little pointless. But enough of that, what about the actual quality of the story? Well, it does have the feel of the original, contrary to my concern, but it also has its own vibe that differentiates it enough not to be a retread. It's perfectly charming and imaginative, which the first game was along with having great characters. And that's where the sequel falls flat. The cast is decently likeable, but most of the side characters are just kind of there, and despite some memorable designs, no one really sticks out personality-wise. Our leads are a whole other thing, because again, they're likeable, but rather than not sticking out, they can be affected by some really shoddy writing. The game is a little too eager to avoid having a mundane opening that affects other RPGs, but this benefited the first game because you got to see Oliver in his day-to-day -day life before embarking on a large adventure. As for Roland, you see him in our world for about a minute before he gets transported, and he adapts to the change very quickly. Soon after, you pretty much forget where he came from outside of a couple of lines. Another example is Tani, a girl you meet early on who's a member of the Sky Pirates. Before you meet her boss, she says this. How could he not be? He's my dad. Batu, the boss, mentions this once as well, but after that, it's barely ever brought up again, and they never talk to or refer to each other in such a way that makes them feel like family, leaving you wondering why the writers would say that they were, only for them to never mention it again. And then there's our main character, Evan Pettywhisker Tildrum. He and Oliver from the first game have something in common. 
as both lose their mothers or mother figure in Evan's case. So let's compare how all those scenes go in both games and see who is the more interesting lead. In the original, it's a gut-wrenching moment as our innocent lead loses all hope and then proceeds to spend the next three days in mourning until he brings Drippy to life and eventually agrees to help him after some convincing. As for the sequel, Aranella tells him to build a kingdom where everyone can be happy just before she dies, to which he immediately promises and soon after doesn't seem that upset about the whole thing. Okay, they are different approaches, but Evan just isn't very interesting, and aside from becoming more of a leader, doesn't really grow as a character. It also doesn't help that his struggle isn't as compelling, mainly due to there not being an underlining threat. Yes, there are villains, but they're mostly shoved to the side, and there's quite a few times when the story ends up becoming a political fantasy, with you uncovering a money scam and getting other kingdoms to sign a peace treaty. Even though it does highlight how little conflict there can be at times, that's the kind of story they wanted to tell, and it's not a massive issue, at least until Chapter 4. As the Kingdom of Evermore finally begins to come together, the plot just crawls to a halt! You have to partake in a series of quests for a librarian, and nothing story-wise actually happens until the very end. Look, the first game had padding as well, but things still happened in the narrative during those sections. Here, this entire chapter mainly functions as a tutorial for certain mechanics, some of which the player will already be familiar with, and with nothing interesting going on in the background, it drags the pacing down considerably. But with all that said, I did enjoy joining these characters as they adventured across the world in similar fashion to the first game. It would have been nicer if they were more interesting, yes, but there is still fun to have with this story regardless. And that's all I can really say. While it is a very flawed plot, I did enjoy the sense of adventuring with a group of heroes as they encounter new trials and tribulations. It doesn't do it amazingly well, nor as good as the original, but the spirit of the first game remains intact, and that helped make this subpar story into a decent one. The gameplay is the most important part of any game, however. The story is just the icing on the cake if it's great. So, can it elevate this experience to a higher level? Well, there's a lot to talk about, so let's get straight into it. Low navigating the world map has many narrow paths, Exploring the many environments is considerably less linear than before, thanks to obviously the location design, but also the freer movement. Jumping was an unlockable bonus in the first game, whereas here you can jump really goddamn high to get to extra nooks and crannies. I have to say, most of the environments are really well designed and quite interesting to explore, and the great graphics definitely help in this regard. What doesn't help is having to revisit a lot of the same areas. I can't tell you how many times I teleported back to Goldpore throughout the story, and often without having visited anywhere new, meaning that you'll be sick of returning to the same few areas during a chunk of the game. But when you do finally get to go to new locations, they're cool to explore. But while the changes made to the exploration are marginal, the new additions to the combat are giant in comparison. Yes, you can move about the attack space freely like in the first, but that's where the similarities end. It feels more like a hack and slash game for a start, and you can only have four special attacks for each character at one time, along with having a long range weapon. But the most notable change comes with the Higgledies. These rather cute creatures replace the Millias and will always be on the battlefield. Run over to them to activate a special attack which they'll carry out alongside you. Mwahaha! Now the Higgledies shall do my dirty work for me! It's a very basic system that you spend a lot of time with, ironically seeing as Evan strives to be a pacifist, and it can be quite fun. It controls well, attacks feel satisfying to use, and it can even be exciting at times. But other times, it can be repetitive and honestly, a little monotonous. Yes, there's always going to be times in an RPG when you get a little tired of fighting enemies, even in the first game. But if the combat's good, it's only a minor annoyance, so why is it such a big issue here? Well, in regards to the first game, there were plenty of lengthy breaks in the story where there was no combat, but you were always unlocking new spells and familiars to use in said fights so that they consistently felt fresh. 
As for its sequel, you're thrown almost straight into the action, and from there, it almost never lets up. That's not always a bad thing depending on the game, but here, the combat remains unchanged for pretty much the entire duration, with changes to the formula happening if you make some changes to your party, which I never felt interested enough to do. It also doesn't help that there aren't many actual tactics to beating the enemy other than just going full force on them, and after a while, it gets tiring. I found myself actively avoiding optional fights fairly regularly, not that it really matters, because you can hold your own against enemies 10 levels above you. Again, it's not bad, there's times when it's good fun, but when so much of the game consists of going to a place to defeat some more enemies in the same fashion, it can get dull. Despite the combat taking up a vast amount of your overall playtime, there's still a couple of other things on the side for you to do. There's a few unique sections, for example this trial where you have to walk across the panels in the right order. These sections aren't common, but they do make things a bit more interesting, and they're decent. But as for substantial parts of the game, you eventually get the option to take part in skirmishes, in which you and your army must take down the enemy forces on the world map. Well, that sounds pretty cool, so how does it actually play out? Right men, are you ready for this? Charge! Yeah, you don't really do anything but run to the enemies for your army to attack. Yes, you can activate some special moves and bring in reinforcements, but that's about it. It's okay, yes it's easy and can feel a little throwaway at times, but as a minor side activity, it's fine. And then there's the Kingdom Management System. Though it boils down to setting up shops, putting the right people in charge, and then upgrading said shops, some of the things you can buy can actually be really useful, so I did find myself getting particular shops up and running. It's not as in-depth as some other strategy games of similar style, but as it's not the main bulk of the game, it's not too bad. This game does have quite a bit to offer, and it takes its time to reveal all of what is possible, so there's often something interesting to try out. None of it is amazing, and it can get monotonous at times, but the game's heart kept me going regardless. And I have to say, while I don't love this game, it still kept me engaged, unlike some of Level 5's other recent-ish titles. This is definitely the closest they've come to replicating the feel of their prime, and seeing as their golden era is one that inspired me a lot, and is practically the reason you're watching this video, for them to at least capture that spirit a little was nice. But in the end, Nino Kuni 2, while not the insult to the original I feared it might be, isn't even close to matching the quality of the first game. Though the story leaves a lot to be desired and the gameplay can feel a little disposable, none of it is outright bad and there are times when it can be quite fun. The presentation is great all around, and its charm combined with the imagination that the original did so well is replicated somewhat in its sequel, making sure I enjoyed returning to this world. If you loved the original as much as I did, chances are you'll agree with my thoughts on its sequel, which is overall solid, but very flawed. And for every reason mentioned thus far, I'll score Nino Kuni to 74%. It certainly exceeded my expectations, but when they weren't that high to begin with, I was left with a title that's certainly memorable, considering how much I've talked about it, but far from perfect. If you touch it, it will sort of remember you, and that means you can return to it whenever you like. Okay, remember me! To say goodbye, remember me Don't let it make you cry